Farmland has been losing roughly zero since Europeans first arrived in North America. 07 inches of soil a year, which is about twice the rate of erosion that the U.S. Department of Agriculture deems sustainable. What is the outlook? Well, perspectives vary, but if nothing changes, there's just one way to put it, gloomy. In less than 30 years, U.S. soil could deteriorate to the point where only 5% of the land will be unaffected. Yes, farming practices should be changed first because they are the ones that cause the most damage, but the states have developed a unique and rather unusual method of restoring the land, releasing bison, the iconic animal in North America, onto bear. Soil, after which we begin to determine what transpires and why these hoof giants suddenly prove to be one of the means of halting land degradation. In the past, bison roamed North America in such vast numbers that you could almost see one at every corner. This map illustrates the areas where bison lived. The Great Bison Belt, which stretches from Alaska to the Gulf of Mexico, was once home to these animals before humans arrived. Scientists say that nearly the whole area of what is now the U.S., a large portion of contemporary Canada, and a small portion of Mexico were home to them. To put it briefly, there was an abundance of it. The grass provided the ideal sustenance for bison, which is why they disperse over such vast regions. Until people began to settle in the region, a great number of animals lived in the Great Bison Belt. More specifically, when European colonists arrived in the 1500s, the Spanish brought horses to. Although horses aren't predators that would hunt bison, it's no big deal that bison started living with them in North America. However, the spread of horses was welcomed by the Plains Indians, who had a means of transportation that made it simple to chase herds and hunt bison more frequently by the early 19th century, when there were roughly 60,000 plains. Between 300,000 and 900,000 horses were owned by Indians, enabling them to hunt on an amazing scale. For instance, in 1840, they killed about 500,000 bison for food and an additional 100,000 for trade in the East. In addition, horses and bison competed for grazing, which had a significant effect on the number of the animals we're talking about today in the North. Before humans arrived, there were a lot of bison in North America. However, by 1900, about 30 million cattle were grazing in the Great Bison Belt, pushing the bison out just like the horses did. This is what happened when cattle let cows arrive and began spreading diseases that killed off bison. Since no one was around to count them, they estimated that there were roughly 60 million bison in North America prior to the 1870s. The map's lightest color indicates the animal's range, so yes, since people had been hunting bison for a very long time by that point, their habitat was nothing like what it had been. Prior to the arrival of humans, bison roamed a vast portion of North America. Then the slaughter started and pictures like this one appeared demonstrating that no bison ever encountered humans without becoming the target of someone's attention. As a result, the range had shrunk to what is shown here in brown, but no one stopped. Killing bison, which caused their range to be reduced to these black dots by 1890. By 1884, there were only 325 American bison remaining. Just consider how the number of animals fell from 60 million to just 300 in just 20 years. The bison's near extinction also negatively impacts the environment. As the species is essential to the American short grass prairies, bison prevented trees from encroaching on the open meadows by scratching them with their horns. When the animals grazed, they dispersed seeds and they also rolled, which is another characteristic that impacts the prairies. When the bison repeatedly roll in the mud or dust, shallow pits form. When spring arrives, the pits fill up with water, creating a lot of wetland areas with distinctive vegetation. Where do the seeds come from? The bison carry them in their fur because they are big and decomposing, which makes them a good source of phosphorus and nitrogen for plants. They also graze in big, close-knit groups, which results in a patchwork of, with the near-complete extinction of American hoofed animals, short grasses were replaced by less resilient tall ones that couldn't handle the uneven terrain. This unevenness is important for many animal species, some of which prefer short grass, while others prefer tall grass. Climate conditions in the Great Bison Belt, which is why many regions lost all of their grass cover. The big cattle that took the place of North American bison graze wild on the verdant meadows, negatively affecting the local ecology and contributing to the bareness of the formerly verdant prairies. As agriculture advanced, more than 4,600 square miles of pasture on the U.S. southern plains were reduced to roughly 695 square miles by 1926. In other U.S. regions, the situation wasn't much better. This was already an ecological catastrophe of unimaginable proportions, but another one that shocked everyone came next because Following the devastation of pastures caused by the Dust Bowl of the 1930s, which blew away 850 million tons of topsoil and carried it into the Atlantic Ocean, everyone realized that something needed to change. One such change was to increase the number of bison, which used to protect the health of America's green spaces. 
Yellowstone National Park was one of the first locations where efforts were made to restore the American bison population. At first, only 25 of these animals sought refuge there, and it's difficult to imagine that number increasing over time, but the park managed to do so with the help of groups of biologists, ecologists, and enterprising individuals. And government officials have been working tirelessly to restore the population, so by 2022, there will be roughly 5,900 bison in Yellowstone Park. It is clear that the park's ecosystems and land are supported in a variety of ways because despite being one of the most well-known parks in the U.S., no one minimizes the bison's significance. Let's travel to the Midwind National Tall Grass Prairie in the Chicago area to maintain the health of the local landscape. The bison were eradicated there in the past, so there was probably never anything alive on the land, and to top it off, there are parks on the site of a former U.S. Army munitions factory, which doesn't exactly leave the surrounding area. Although the land is in excellent condition, there are currently nine square miles of prairies with a variety of plant communities, birds, and animals. Since 1996, conventional land restoration techniques like planting, mowing, burning, and herbicides have been employed here, but 2015 saw the appearance of bison close to Chicago and based on the park's current appearance. Bison are a fantastic solution that's helped restore the area and keep it in good condition. But this is only the beginning. Researchers are so interested in the possibilities of land restoration using bison and other methods that the experiment, which began near Chicago, is scheduled to last for 20 years or until 2035. This makes it one of the most active groups restoring the American prairies. By 2024, the Habitat of the American Prairie Foundation, or APF, will have expanded to 526,000 acres, with 14,000 acres going to private ownership and 385,000 acres of state land under lease. The APF purchases and leases land to connect the reserve and establish a continuous wildlife corridor. Covering nearly 3,212,000 acres, a number of techniques, including the previously mentioned bison, will be used Eagles, to restore the land in this area. And ferrets, Up to 10,000 of them will be used. Dogs. Initially, project participants stated that the implementation would be lengthy and extremely challenging, but now everyone agrees because there are some intermediate. Results. In 2005, a few dozen bison were introduced to Montana, and as of 2025, American Prairie is home to between 900 and 1,000 animals roaming across 59,000 acres. This may not seem like much, but bison are already making a significant, albeit small, contribution to the restoration of Montana's prairies, which has resulted in the legendary American animal's fertility declining over time. It's important to note that the project also aims to make sure the herd is genetically robust, which will significantly aid in the restoration of the bison population in North America as a whole and the long-term survival of the. Let's move on to Kansas, which is arguably the center of the Great Bison Belt and has seen both prairies and the decline of bison. In 2023, American Prairie took in 80 animals from a bison herd in Colorado, as well as from another herd in Montana. As a result, in 2024, cows were born that are a mix of several bloodlines. The KKZA Prairie Biological Station, which is 13 square miles of local tall grass prairies in the hilly Flint Hills region that is jointly owned by Kansas State University and the Nature Conservancy, is a site of land degradation. About 30 years ago, researchers started a lengthy experiment to determine how bison and smaller cattle can influence the local prairies. In one section of the research station, a herd of 120 bison was left. They lived there all year round. In another section, the cattle grazed from April to November before being removed from the fields and given additional food for the winter. In other sections, there was no grazing at all. This was, let's say, a simulation of the conditions. The land was periodically burned to mimic the fires that occurred on the prairies prior to the arrival of those who caused the most harm to bison, European settlers, which led to the complete extinction of both cattle and bison. One may wonder why something that damages forests is being imitated. Every year, everything connected to nature turns out to be essential because despite how strange it may sound, burning plants has historically increased the number of bison and generally aids in plant growth because freshly burned areas are rich in nutrients, which draw bison eager to restore them. There is also information. Because Native American tribes use controlled burns to expand the low grass plains and influence the ecology of the Great Bison Belt, researchers at Cape Prairie employed this strategy for their experiments. Once the cattle and bison were allocated to designated areas and a grazing-free zone was established, the scientists surveyed the area and tallied. Over the years, a pattern emerged in which the number of four dominant grass species declined as the bison grazed them. At the same time, other native prairie plants took root, and as a result, the number of local plant species in areas where bison grazed increased by 86% over the course of three decades. 
The scientists who conducted the research for this project concluded that many meadows in the central Great Plains have much lower plant biodiversity than they did prior to the mass extermination of bison. In other words, bison nearly double the wealth of the prairies when compared to areas without grazing. Of local may the panna in the form of bison will aid in restoring the meadow's biodiversity. Not to be overlooked, another kind of cattle participated in the experiments and, like bison, increased biodiversity. However, plants only grew 30% more than on land without grazing. It's safe to say that restoring and maintaining healthy prairies is all about bison, bison, and more bison. In addition to all of these studies, scientists discovered that the prairie flora was even able to survive the severe droughts of 2011 and 2012 because of the bison. It's also been noted that some local species suffered in the years preceding the drought, but they recovered because of the bison. In addition, the local species population continued to increase because of these fabled hooved creatures. You read correctly, bison are also saviors when it comes to something that many scientists and environmental organizations are concerned about these days. The effects of restoring lands that lost their natural state due to human activity is largely dependent on climate change, which is essentially bringing more bison back to North America. The recovery is occurring, albeit slowly, but it is happening nonetheless. Today, bison only occupy less than 1% of their historic range, and their numbers are far from the 60 million that they once inhabited. There are currently less than 20,000 bison and herds protected on federal, tribal, or private conservation lands, but based on what we discussed today, there are a lot of restoration projects out there. And that's just a small fraction of all the efforts. Many states have multiple bison herds. Restoration projects underway, so it doesn't seem that far-fetched to restore the entire Great Bison Belt with its verdant prairies in the future. Yes, reviving bison and other animal populations can prevent the desertification of North America's pastures, but the benefits of hoofed. The impact of releasing animals on troubled lands can be even greater if they are introduced in accordance with a plan rather than at random. Alan Savory believes that he has spent the majority of his life researching this, so there is good reason to trust the strategy he developed. Take a look at these leaves that fall from the trees each year like clockwork. When cattle graze, they trample the plants into the ground, causing biological decomposition. This results in a fertile soil cover that can support a wide range of plant growth. If livestock don't graze, anything that falls to the ground decomposes slowly due to chemical oxidation in the sun, which is bad for fertile land and savory claims that it causes the desertification of large areas. He suggests harming livestock, including bison, in order to restore the lost lands, but this isn't just any grazing. The scientists suggest arranging animal movements with complete control and planning. This method is known as holistic planned grazing. Mimic how wild animals roamed around before humans arrived, limiting plant grazing and maximizing soil benefits from hoof trampling, which decomposes old plants and manure, which serves as a natural fertilizer. However, achieving this is not simple. First, you must determine how. Second, holistic planned grazing is a complicated strategy that involves many steps to implement. First, livestock farmers must divide their land into grazing sections, after which they must erect fences or other barriers to separate the animals. This will allow the animals to move across the land precisely, transforming barren soil into fertile ground. Zones when developing a grazing plan, they should determine how long the animals will remain in one area, where they will go next, and when and for how long they will return. In addition, they must determine the type of landscape they wish to create and how much feed the land should supply during the designated period. Yes, all of this must be done well. Consider elements that impact the grazing plan, such as when grazing areas will be snow-covered or fire-prone, when and where ground-nesting birds will appear and lay their eggs, and much more. Does it really work? Many experts are skeptical, but the Savory Institute makes it abundantly evident that the scientist's method actually transforms arid land into something better. For instance, the trees are like distinct objects that aren't connected by greenery, and there isn't much vegetation between them. However, you can already see an area where comprehensive planned grazing took place. The land hasn't become the most fertile zone on Earth, but the bison are already doing a good job of restoring the land. But if we graze them according to savory strategy, the effectiveness of the transformation could likely increase and the resilience of the land will improve as well. The differences are obvious even to the unaided eye, as the trees don't seem separate because there is much more greenery growing between them. In summary, bison only provide advantages to music. 